Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to your webinar, Introduction to Reckon Accounts Lists. My name is Vicky, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately 45 minutes to 15 minutes of questions. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on the webinar's control panel. Our presenter today is Graham Meredith. Graham is the principal of Booker's Bookkeeping and is a chartered accountant with over 25 years accounting experience. An accredited Reckon Accounts trainer since 2007, Graham is passionate about teaching and also enjoys the challenge of running his own businesses and providing practical solutions for his clients. Today, Graham will take us through how to manage your lists. Graham will be taking you through the vast array of lists in Reckon Accounts and hints and tips along the way to best use the list to your advantage. Without further ado, I'll just hand you over to Graham. Hi Vicky, thank you very much for that introduction. Hello everyone, nice to have you back. Uh, weather is not so wonderful where I am today, but we can't have it perfect every day of the year. And in fact, we desperately need some rain here in the Highlands, so that's quite good. So today, what are we talking about? We're talking about the lists within Reckon Accounts, and there's quite a number of them. Uh, just to give an idea, if you don't know me, uh, as Vicky kindly mentioned a few things, but I am a Reckon accredited partner, have been for the last 10 years. I am actually a chartered accountant by trade. I teach at TAFE, teaching the certificate for and bookkeeping. I do all the Reckon Accounts training courses that run in North Sydney for this particular product, Reckon Accounts, and a registered BAS agent, so right now is very busy with the next lodgement date being tomorrow. And a key focus that I like to have is to work on making accounting made easy or making accounting easy to understand and to perform in businesses. Look, like any typical webinar, the information that I provide today is purely of a general nature and will not constitute advice. And if you do need specific advice uh, in regards to a specific circumstance, you should actually consult with a professional advisor. So lists, it's interesting uh, and one of the things I'll ask you to think about is how many of the lists do you actually use within Reckon Accounts? To give you an idea of the lists that there are, I'm going to run through them before I jump into Reckon Accounts. Of course, there's the list that's the chart of accounts and that's obviously a critical one. Without the chart of accounts, we couldn't operate the program. We have the item list which produces all the items that we use when we're invoicing in particular. There's a fixed asset item list, which a lot of people don't know about. There's a price level list, and in fact, we can have up to 200 different price levels within the program. So that it's quite uh, unique and quite sophisticated in the ability of how many, as I say, how many different price levels you can actually run. There is a billing rate level list, and the beauty of the billing rate level is you can actually link the billing rate to a number of service items. So if you change at the end of the year the billing rate from, say, $85 to $95, you only have to change that in one location to get all those service items to change accordingly. So that's obviously a huge time saver compared to actually doing it one by one. We have the tax item list and the tax code list, and even though it mentions tax, it is actually referring to GST tax. And I will be showing you those and showing you how you can make your life a bit easier. We have the payroll item list, and these are all the different payroll items that we have that we utilise uh, to record all the different pays that or style of pay that we would be giving our employees. The class list is, is what we would use if we were doing what I, I refer to as divisional reporting. So if we want to report by state, if we're a large entity, or if we want to report by department, we can set up classes or lists for each of those areas for each state or for each department. And by doing that, we can then report purely on that specific location and see what the problem that location. We also have the other names list, which I'll take you through, but to be honest, I actually prefer to focus on the customer and supplier profile list uh, rather than using the other name list. Because under the here, not only can we have a customer type list and a supplier type list, but we can have sales rep list, 
we can have a job type list and we can have our terms list as well. And obviously by terms I'm talking about do we offer 14 days, 30 days end of month, etc. And we can do multiple of course. We'll also see we can have a customer message list. So we can actually send out a generic customer message to all our clients. So it might be in April and we've got a special program, a, a promotional program running. We can actually put that onto every customer's invoice during that period. There's payment method lists if we want to record the different methods that we get paid by. And this can be quite handy because rather than stick your finger in the air and say, oh, I think probably 5% is now cash these days and the rest FPOS, you can actually scientifically prove that. The ship via list and also the vehicle list. So we can actually run a list of vehicles. We can actually put kilometres against those vehicles to see how we're travelling. We will then finish off with the memorised transactions list. So if we've got a standard transaction, I'll give the example of rent. If we've got the same amount of rent being paid every month and it's on a direct debit out of our bank account, rather than actually manually inserting that transaction in every month, we can actually set up a memorised transaction and we can set up, like I typically say, put it in seven days in advance of the payment date but it'll still put it in on the due date so I can see it on my bank register from seven days in advance that that money's coming out. And finally, a favourite of mine, the memorised report list, we will also have a look at that so I can explain in more detail what happens with the memorised report list or more to the point, what you can do. Now I'm just going to move over to Reckon Accounts. Now the program is a highly sophisticated program and the reality is most users are probably using somewhere around 30-40% of the capability. So I'm just going to tell you one or two other little tricks as well. Now first thing I'm going to say is it's all in the setup. And what I mean by that is that you can actually change the preferences for it to work exactly how you want. Now where are the preferences? If you go edit and down the bottom is preferences, you've actually got a huge range of preferences, both under my preferences and company preferences. What's the difference? My preferences impact just you as a user if you have your own username to go into the file. If you have multiple users, only your username will be affected. But when you make a change to company preferences, which you can only do in what is referred to as single user mode, you will then affect the entire file. So any user will then have that change. But I'm just going to say I don't have the time to go through this today. I can take up to an hour just on these preferences. But go through and have a look and uh, it can certainly speed up the time of how you do things. So I know we live in a very busy lifestyle these days, but I am saying please take the opportunity to have a look here because it can certainly make your life a lot easier. Okay. Now, the first one I mentioned was the chart of accounts. Now, over here is the chart of accounts. Under lists, the first one is chart of accounts. And what I'm pointing out is there's more than one way to get to just about not only any list but any function within Reckon Accounts. But I'm going to go Control A. And Control A, no matter where you are in the program, will actually get you to the chart of accounts. Now, there's a couple of things that I want to highlight here. The beauty is if I want to see cash on hand at the top of my other current assets, I can actually put my mouse over the diamond and you'll see it changes. I'm going to then put down my left click on my mouse and I drag it to the top of other current assets. Now, if I was to show these items there on the balance sheet, on a balance sheet report, cash on hand has now gone to the top of other current assets on my balance sheet. So I can move or manipulate these items around here and move them wherever I want. So buildings below furniture and fixtures. Might put it back because I like I like uh, it being in the correct order. 
on the correct spelling, but by moving those around that will impact the reporting, how the reporting will look. Now fixed assets, if I try and move it into other current, it won't let me do it because it must be of the same type of asset or the same type of uh, or revenue expenditure, etc. Now another thing I want to highlight, it's down here, let's see accountancy fees. Now if I go to the home page at the moment and I enter a bill and I'm going to call it Kelly Partners for 550 Whoop, and I go accounting fees, you'll notice that the tax code is not there. Now I can drop down or I could have typed it but I can go NCG and there's the tax code. But I'm going to go escape, so I'm not going to save this transaction. Reason I didn't want to save it is to prove what I do now does make the change. I'm going to go right click and I'm going to go E for edit account. Down here tax code, I'm going to put in NCG. Go save and close and you'll notice I now have it over here. So now if I enter a bill and so Kelly Partners 550 accountancy and you'll notice that the tax code came up. Now I could still change it if it was for ASIC filing fees to NCF but what it highlights is if you have the default codes here for your expenditure and your revenue in particular, they will be utilised when you're actually using them to enter bills or to raise invoices, etc. Uh, so it is, I always think, very important to do that. Now you can imagine there's a lot of expenses here, so to actually do that job is going to take me a fair while. There is a trick. I can actually go File, down to Utilities, and I can go Export, List to IIF Files, I click on my chart of accounts, I go OK, it puts it into a location that I want it in and I'm going to, sorry, I'll just go down, I'm going to call it COA for chart of accounts and that has been successfully exported. Now, if I go looking for that item, So if I go into data and there's that chart of accounts, okay, it didn't want me to do it that way, so what I'll do is I open up Excel I'm going to go open, browse, sorry, introduction to record accounts list. Now it says all Excel files. I'm going to say all files and there's my chart of accounts because it's in what's called IIF but we leave it in that. It now asks me to how to set it up. I simply go through the process. Here they all come, all, all the chart of accounts which looks like a boatload of gobbledygook of course. Um, now just I just want to check something at the top before I go racing off. Yep. So if we go all the way down to looking for accountancy fees. Now the beauty is I did copy it out. Now I know I'm going to go over a number of non-tax codes, but if I go through here. Uh, terrific. Uh, I haven't activated. But what I was, uh, sorry, I've got a slight technical issue here by the look of it. But what I was going to prove is that if I had have dragged it down, it should then copy all of those. And I'll just show you an example. Okay, sorry, I've had a problem with my activation. It'll take a little while to fix, so I'll leave that. And actually, bear with me. Uh, 
wants a lot of information from me. Technology is a wonderful thing, but it can trip you up as well. Okay, so now I can go activate. Now, thank you. Now I can do what I was aiming to do before. So I can go all the way down. I'll leave it to about motor vehicles. Why is it not letting me do it? Okay, for some reason it is chucking a wobbly with me, but it should have allowed all those to come through. Now the key part is, oh, I would have then been able to, sorry, for speed of the purpose, the speed of this I'm going to have to jump out. What it would have allowed me to do is to come back and import, and I would have imported that if file. I would have found it when I'd saved it and I can then go bang and it would have brought it in and what we were going to see, but unfortunately we're not going to see today, so I apologise that it decided to chuck a wobbly. It's always wonderful when it worked about 15 minutes ago or 20 minutes ago. But what it would have done was down here on this tax area, it would have actually had all the NCG showing up in one hit. And in that, when I was in the Excel file, I could have even deleted for things such as depreciation. All that is, is just speeding up the process of having to do this. So you can see, even though I've had problems, by going one at a time, even with problems, if I went and fixed my activation, exported the list, the chart of accounts list, made the changes to the tax codes in Excel and brought it back in, it's going to be way faster than actually doing it one at a time. But the key part is that I wanted to highlight is put the tax codes in, the default codes, because it is going to speed up the time when you are doing things like entering a bill. The other thing is we can have the situation where we have certain items that we don't want. And let's say we don't want fire brigade fees. I can go control D or I could have gone account delete and you'll see it's let me delete that. Now let me delete it because there, was no there were no transactions, there was no transactional data in that account. If there was any data in that account, and let's look at accountancy fees, I go control D and it says I can't delete this account because there's data there. I can make it inactive however. Now what that means is, I'll go like that and it disappears. But if I tick down here include inactive, and you'll see there's a number of others, these items with crosses, if there's transactional data in those accounts, it will still come up when I do the reports, but I can no longer use that account to put data into. So I'm going to untick that cross so I can use it again. So when I bring it out, there it is. So a trick is, if it's an early day or you go in now and go, beauty, I've got a stack of accounts I want to make inactive, click on the include inactive and tick them over here. If when you go to click on that, it won't let you, that means there's no inactive accounts. So simply find one that you want to do, right click, hit the make account inactive and from then on you'll be able to open up and just merely tick what you want to make inactive. Okay, the other key is sometimes we have an issue where same account name, we might have it in there three different what names and it's a bit frustrating. And here's a classic, we've got director's emoluments and director's fees. Now emoluments was meant to be director's fees. If I right click on that and go edit and if I type fees and now I try and save it, will tell me that name's already been used and would I like to merge them? I say yes. And now you'll notice we have purely director's fees. Emoluments, any transactions that were in emoluments has now gone into director's fees. Okay. 
The other thing I just want to highlight is for before we move on from the chart of accounts is in regards to payroll because we're going to do some little tricks in payroll in a minute. So I just want to show you a couple of tricks here first. Uh, and this this has been recorded, I believe, and therefore you'll be able to go back, even though I'm going quite quickly, you'll be able to go back and get a copy of this if you want. You'll see payroll liabilities. What I like to do is go new and I go an other current liability because that's where the payroll liabilities are and I go PAYG withheld. I make it a sub-account of payroll liabilities. I then go save and new. I then go superannuation liability. Sub-account of payroll liabilities. Save and close. I prefer super below PAYG withheld so I drag it down. I then go down to wages. And when I look for wages, I can see if I look closely enough. Oh, sorry, I'm in income, so I'll move down to expenses. And I can find payroll expenses. If I look further, can I see salaries and wages? Yes, salaries. And also half a dozen different superannuation types. So what I might do is I go, you know what, I'm going to edit that account and I'm going to call it gross salaries, or oh, sorry, I'm going to call it salaries and wages. I'm going to change that one to gross salaries and wages and I'm going to put it under the account salaries and wages. Now the next thing I do is I want super for in super contributions under salaries and wages as well. So I simply grab it, go salaries and wages and there we are and again I put that down below because I like super below the gross salaries. So now I've set up how I want to see my payroll in the chart of accounts. So when you see the profit and loss, you can see as a total salaries and wages, but you can see the subtotals of the salaries and wages and the super contributions, super expense. Similarly, up in the balance sheet, we're going to be able to see not just the total liabilities of payroll, but we'll be able to see a split between pay as you go withheld and the super liability. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one which is the item list. Now again, if I go to the home page, there's my items and services here, or I can go lists and there's the item list. Okay. Now you'll notice that we have a range of different items here, services, non-inventory, other charges, etc. Now I'm just going to go to the home page and you'll notice there's nothing up here which tells me inventory is not turned on. So I can actually go to edit, preferences and I'm going to go down to items and inventory and I'm going to say make that active. When I did that all of a sudden we had extra buttons, extra icons turn up here. And when I go back to the item list, a key thing is when I do a new item I'm going to see some extra buttons that I can press. Now I can go item new or I can go control N and up it brings. Now you're going to notice service, inventory, part, assembly, inventory, non-inventory, part, other charts, subtotal, group, discount and payment. Got a huge amount of items that we can do. Service is the most common one used and in fact I've seen every item as a service item in some accounts. But you can do some pretty cool tricks. So you'll see you use services use for services you charge for or purchase like specialised labour consulting hours or professional fees. So say in my case I sell uh, Baz Advice and I could call it that services 
for preparing BAS and I can put in say 95 GST code, I put in to sales and there we are, I've set up a service item. But there are plenty of others and you'll notice that I've actually set a lot of them up. But just to go back, if I go new, you can actually click on them and over here it will tell you what they are. So you'll see how you can do assembly, non-inventory, other charges which is for such as delivery charges, setup fees and service charges. I'm also going to just show you one other service item. If you've actually got a subcontractor, so say you're a plumber and you've got other plumbers that subcontract to you and you sell their time, I can actually put say plumbing and put uh, Now you'll see as required for, I always put as much information that I can do as standard and we'll see why in an invoice shortly. But in this case, I've actually got a subby. So you'll see this service is used in assemblies or is performed by a subcontractor or partner. I click on that. I can now put, I mean I can put whatever I want in the purchase, but he charges me $40 plus GST an hour and I, I sell his time for $80 plus GST an hour. So I can actually set that up accordingly in service. Now why have I got all these different ones? I'm going to show you. If I go to invoices and here if I drop down and I take Harper's Music Emporium, by the way they're based in Sydney so I've set up the class so I can get all this information just under Sydney. And I go down here and I might have, whoops, sorry, four hours of drafting fee, hourly rate for drafting services, um, and four hours for design fee. Now, I want to give the guy a discount for that, um, sorry, just got to move something out of my way so I can see what I'm doing. Uh, you'll see that it's for 900 plus GST. I want to give the guy a 10% discount. Now if I go DIS, which I set up earlier, discount offered minus 10% or 10%. So it's taken 10%, but unfortunately not 10% of the entire invoice because it only takes 10% of the transaction above. So you'll see the $60. But if I come back here, and one trick you can do is, and this works both with delete and insert, but I'm going to go control insert, if I can find my insert button. And in fact, another way just to show another trick with that is I can actually go right click and go insert line. And here I'm going to put in SUB for subtotal. Now all of a sudden it added the lines above and then the discount actually came off that line above being the subtotal. So that way I was able to get the correct amount. At the same time, um, I've actually received $150 for this already. So I can actually go 150 here. Now notice I typed in 150 but it knows it's a payment so it made it a negative. So not only is it $900 less the 90 discount, it's also less the 150 paid. And so now we're down at 741. So what I'm showing is you can do a vast array of changes to your invoices purely by setting things up correctly in your item list. So if you don't use your item list to the full extent, it's certainly worth going and looking. And as I mentioned, if you click on item, go to new, you'll see the different types of items that you can use and that way you can actually set up accordingly. What else have we got? I mentioned fixed asset items. Now I know there's none in the list, but if I go here and I go new, you'll see that you can actually put asset numbers in if you've got asset numbers or the name, 
you can allocate it to the correct account, you can advise whether it was new or used on purchase and obviously set up the date of purchase and put a fair bit of information in here in regards to descriptions. So this is one way, it's not a 100% set up as an asset register but it certainly goes a long way to assisting in regards to asset registers. Price level list. Now I mentioned that you can have up to 200 different price levels. So the beauty of this is you can actually set up different price levels on everything per item or I can simply work on a percentage basis. So I could say this price level will increase items by precisely. Now if I went 10, it then goes 10%, say no rounding and I'm going to say retail plus 10 as the price level name. I go OK, now if I go in there it will mean that every time I use that price level it will actually add 10%. So let's have a look, I've got services preparing for BAS of $95, I've got uh, customers Customers, butlers, design and homewares. I go in here, I go to the price level, I add retail plus 10 and I'm now going to do an invoice for butlers. And when I get down to the BAS advice, you'll notice that the price is actually 10450 rather than $95 because it has added 10% to that price list. So you could have three different levels of wholesalers that you sell to um, and give them all the different price variations. So it's quite a powerful uh, list, this particular list. Now similar to the price list, on the other side is the billing rate list. So here the beauty is you can actually have a group of items that are under the same rate and the beautiful part about this is, is if you make a change here it will make a change across the entire board and here you can see you can actually click into the help menu and it will show you exactly how that works. Next I want to show you a tax item and tax code. Now you'll notice that there's a huge number of tax items in this list. You're probably not going to use them all. In fact most of my clients only use six particular codes. They are GST which is the sale of items with GST, free which would be the sale of items that are free, and say a mechanical workshop I, I have as a client, they have a Vietnam War vet who has exemption from paying GST, so we've been able to set up his customer file as free and all his anything that's sold to him, whether labour or parts, is sold GST free. If we receive interest, I'll put it against the free category if we receive interest income. The other ones we use are NCG, which is the purchase of goods with GST, NCF for the purchase of goods that are GST free, such as rates, water, uh, we might buy milk or bread or water from the grocery store and I can allocate it accordingly. The other two are C, the final two of the six are CAG and CAF, capital acquisition with GST, so I buy a car from a motor dealer and CAF, I buy a car from a private person. Now most of my clients, I don't want them getting confused and being able to put all these different accounts in, so I go to include in active, which you'll notice I'm clicking on and it won't work, but if I right click and I go make item inactive, so one item, now I can click on it and now what I do is I simply go down, whoop, it's not letting me tick in all the right spots but we're getting there now. Now 
almost half these codes are purely relating to the wine equalisation tax. And of course they have to be there because wineries need to be able to use the codes. Now if I go include inactive, there's just those six items in my tax item list. And if I was to go to the home page, sorry, wait a minute, I've done the tax item list. If I now go to the tax code list, I would do exactly the same, which I've already done previously. If I open it up, you'll see all the ones that haven't been uh, ticked as yet. I mean, that have already been ticked to give us those cool ones. So if I go home page, I click on invoices, and now if I was to go to Baz Advice, and then I come over to where it says GST, it only offers me the choice of free or GST. It doesn't offer me any of the others. And similar if I go to enter a bill, and if I go telephone, and I come over here, and it only shows me the four purchase tax codes. So what it does, what we're doing is we're restricting where, what codes you can use. And that is obviously very beneficial because then there's less chance of using the wrong code. Payroll item list. Now this is the list of all the different payroll items that you can utilise. Now if you recall earlier today, or earlier in the session, if I go control A, I actually set up some adjustments. And when I say some adjustments, I set up payroll liabilities with PAYG withheld and super. And then I went to expenses and similar down in expenses. I under salaries and wages, put gross salaries and wages and super. So if I go back to the payroll item list, by the way, if you're wondering how has it got that open window list, I've never seen that before. Gone. But if I go view open window list, top item. Now, in here, I want to see where the accounts are going to, where these items are going to, what accounts, and I can't see it at the moment. If I go down to payroll item, and you'll see customise columns. When I come here, I can click on expense account and add, liability account and add. And when I go OK, all of a sudden, they're there. Now I could adjust it even further. Like I might say, get rid of the account ID, and we want to move these up a couple, so I go move up and then liability move up as well, and now they're over here. Now the reason I wanted to do that is because I look at PAYG tax, that's going to payroll liabilities. But what I'm going to do is if I right click and I go edit, and here at payroll liabilities, I now change it to pay as you go withheld. So it will show it as a sub account there. And similar to super, I go into all my super accounts and I change the liability to super liability and the expense I change to super contributions. And having done that, now what that means is the super expense will be shown in the PNL under super contributions and the liability for super, or if I show in the chart of accounts, any of my super liability will go into this account and any pay as you go will go in here rather than the whole lot going into that one account. So I'll be able to see how much I owe in pay as you go withheld and how much I owe in super rather than having to go into the detail. Similar up here with all my other or hourly and salary accounts, I also make changes to those. So I make change to this one. I will again go in. And instead of payroll expenses, I'll go down to salaries and wages and click on gross salaries and wages. And I'll put all my items in there while I put all my uh, super expense sitting in super contributions. And that way, I'm able to do a split. If you wanted to see allowances, so say travel allowance and car allowance separately within your salaries and wages, you can certainly do that. You just set up the in the chart of accounts for it to be there and then you show the movement here to actually go to the account that you want. 
So as we said, we're going to put all those, for example, to gross salaries and wages. I'm not going to do that now because obviously that would take a long time. List, the next one, class list. So you'll see I've got a number of class lists here. You can simply go down and go new and it will allow you to set up whatever class you want. You can also have it as a subclass. So if I go, um, sorry, I might go Newcastle. No, I'm not going to go right on there. And I want that as a subclass of Sydney. Now I've got a subclass called Rydalmere, so I can get down. So we've got a depot at Rydalmere. I can show all the expenditure at Rydalmere. And if I had a number of depots, they would all uh, add up into Sydney, which then adds up into the total group. You can have up to four subclasses of classes. We also have other names list. This allows you to have names that don't fall under the categories of employees, customers or suppliers. Okay. Next, I'm going to show you, uh, sorry, list, I'm going to show you the customer and supplier profile list. You'll see we can have sales reps. So you can actually, if you've got sales reps, you can set up a list and they can be allocated via invoice so you can see what their sales are. So you're not going through trying to work out what their sales are at the end of each month or quarter. Customer type. We can set up different types of customers. I typically set it up for clients so that they can actually, rather than are they consulting, corporate, etc., but actually the referral type, how they found, how they ended up uh, coming in to be a customer so that people can get an idea of where their marketing is best uh, run or how to best run their marketing. There's job lists, terms lists. Now you'll see that you can have as many different terms as you want. So simply go and create a new one. But I'm going to show you this one, end of next month, which is very common, 30 days end of month is the other term. If I double click, if you want to set up an end of next month, simply instead of standard, click on date driven and say net due 31 days, due the next month if issued within 31 days. And if you do that, I can guarantee you anything that has a May date of an invoice, it will be due at the end of December. Oh, sorry, end of June, as an example. Further in here, you'll see customer message, as I mentioned, where we can set up a standard customer message, which we can then use as we like in regards to uh, putting them on invoices for our clients. Uh, and through payment methods ship via and vehicle lists. We also have templates. Templates is where we go to actually, this list is where we go to change our invoice format if we would like. Then I'm going to get you to memorise transactions. What's the idea of memorise transactions? Well, if you remember I entered that bill, um, okay, sorry, I didn't uh, escape. No, home, enter bills. I did that bill for Kelly Partners. Now say they're charging me that every month. What I could actually do is go edit, memorise bill. I'm going to call it Kelly Partners. I'm going to make it a standing order. How often? Monthly. Next date? Well, it went today, so I'm going to say the next date I want is the 27th of March. Number remaining is 10 days in advance. Put it into my account seven days before and OK. Now what that's done, if I get out of there and go to my memorised transaction list, there's that memorised transaction. And because I've got it to automatically set up, seven days before the 27th, so on the 20th of March, when I go into my Reckon accounts, it'll ask me, do I want to put some new uh, entries into the system, I say yes, and it will automatically put that entry in for me rather than me having to do it. So that is a very handy little trick. 
Last but not least, we have, if I go to the report centre, we have an area called memorised reports. Now you can have a range of memorised reports. Now the first thing I normally do, and actually you'll see these pop rivets, here's what I call the navigation pane and to the right are icons. I always drop this down because I make this icon line full of all my transactional or daily in, uh, transactions that I do and I'll show you what I mean. If I click on invoice, I'll go view, add create invoices to the icon bar and there it is. What that means is if I get rid of everything, I can now click one button and I'm in invoices. But let me get back to the memorised transaction list, memorised reports list, sorry. Now, first thing I do is go view, add it to the icon bar, and there's mem reports. So again, I only have to click there and I'm there. Now, why memorise reports? Well, if you've got a group of reports that you've manipulated so that uh, they actually show information that you will customise, you can memorise it and put it in this list. Now, I can open all these reports, so I go there, open that one. Now it's taking a bit of time, so stuff that. I only click on Mem Reports, double click on Accountant, brings up all those reports. I click on Display, and there they all are. And now I can look at them. It's all about making life a lot easier for yourself. So I was able to do that by getting to my memorised reports list. So that just gives you an idea of what you can actually do in regards to Reckon Accounts and all the lists that can make your life a lot easier. Okay, so what we're now going to do is I'm going to hand, hand back to Vicky because we've just got a few minutes where if you have any questions, I can try and answer those for you. Vicky. Thanks, Graham. Yeah, we've just got one question. What were the steps to export the chart of account again? Okay. If I go back, I go File. I go down to Utilities. I go down to Export. And I go list to IIF files. They are the best. When I click on that, it gives me a range of lists that I can actually export out. In this case, I click on the chart of accounts and I will click OK. It will ask me where I want to put it. So in this case, I'm going to say here in the same location. It says it's already there and yes, I want to replace it. What it's done is it has actually exported that chart of accounts out. So if I now go out here to C drive, data, reckon, introduction to the reckon accounts list, there's my chart of accounts. Now the trick is, and unfortunately as you saw, uh, it's a bit like working with dogs and children. Working with software doesn't always work. Reckon software always works, but not here. You'll see that I can open a workbook and I browse. I go to C drive, I go to data, I go to Reckon, and it's not there. The reason is because all Excel files, you need to change that to all files and then it will come up, the IIF file. I then go open literally just click next, next, finish, and up it comes. The important trick is, once you get to this stage, make sure when you, you hit literal file, save, do you want to keep using that format? Yes. And the reason we want to keep using that format is so that when we actually import it back into Reckon Accounts, it's in that same format. Now, you might recall, I actually put a tax code in before we took it out. So the reason I did that is because it's much easier. Oh, there you go, now it decides to work. You can see, so I'll show you the trick I was going to do earlier now. 
because it is a great trick. So I've done all of those. I go File, I go Save. Yes, keep it in that format. I actually then get out of uh, Excel. I'm back in Reckon Accounts. I go File, Utilities, Import, If Files, Chart of Accounts, Open. If it worries you when it goes not responding, what I often say is go and get a cup of tea or a coffee, walk away for a minute because it's best not to impact it because even though it says that, typically it is still working. Unfortunately in my case, it was getting angry. I have to close the program, just bear with me. Um, now it looked like it got to 97% so I'm just going to go control A and I'll go down here. Now notice it did actually import before it crashed, apologies for the crash but you'll see all the tax codes are now in there. Now obviously Things like depreciation do not have a tax code, so I would have left them blank out in Excel. But you can see how many tax codes I've got in there now, which is obviously a lot faster doing it that way than if I had have done it one by one here in the program. Okay, Vicky, back to you. Thank you, Graham. Um, when moving an account in the chart of accounts, do you hold the mouse over the diamond to get the symbol up that move it? Uh, the answer is yes, so I actually move the mouse, it changes as you see to the arrows. Not always though does it change, so the key part is get it over the diamond and once it's over the diamond, click on the left and drag and then you can move it. Thank you. Um, to you Vicky. Yep. That's the end of the question for today, Graham. Okay, well if you've got any other questions, by all means send them through. Vicky will tell you the details and we can always get back to you as well. Great, yes, if you have any questions, please forward them through to training at reckon.com. Thank you, Graeme, for the presentation today. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Reckon Training Academy. So if you don't have access to that yet, please email training at reckon.com and we'll forward access to you. Okay, thank you all for attending today. Have a lovely day and we'll see you in the next webinar.